there's nothing like HIV. There's no disease, no infectious disease that essentially kills everyone who gets it. The fear effect is gone. And yet getting HIV infection is a problem for any individual. The fear should still remain because it's a virus that kills people. There is this sense of complacency that it's better and it, it isn't better. And all these people, these 40 plus million people living with the virus, they will die of AIDS. Over the past three decades, humanity has rallied together for the AIDS cause. People from all walks of life have united across all social and economic boundaries, joining hand in hand for one common purpose, to end AIDS. And I want you to say the name of the person you're walking for. I'm walking for Robert Johnson. I'm walking for Rock Hudson. I'm walking for everybody that isn't here to walk for themselves. The statistics are growing, all except for one. That's the amount of people cured, and it's still zero. In theory, we could cure AIDS on a piece of paper. Maybe someday it'll come. I can't say when. Despite all the major progress we have in chemotherapy of those patients, none of these patients got rid of the virus. I don't think the pharmaceutical industry is very interested or invested in a cure. You know, I, I don't mean to be too cynical, but uh, the reality, I think, is that, you know, the situation they've got now, which is lifetime treatment with expensive drugs, that kind of suits them pretty well. A cure is going to require some, some very tricky and sophisticated molecular biology, and I frankly don't see it happening. Ever? Ever. I was born in 1980, a year before AIDS exploded onto the public consciousness. I grew up beneath its shadow like a child raised under the threat of the mushroom cloud. You might say I am a member of the first HIV AIDS generation. I've never known a world without it. This film is an account of my journey through the shifting sands surrounding HIV AIDS. AIDS has been front page news for nearly 30 years. Yet how much do any of us really know about HIV and AIDS? What is the difference between HIV and AIDS? H uh, I don't know exactly. <laughs> HIV is, 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 wow. HIV is the AIDS is the So, the same thing. AIDS is the actual disease. I don't know really, I don't know the difference. I know HIV is less deadly. For me, there are not necessarily. It's not that I don't have any difference between the two. What would you say is the difference between HIV and AIDS? Yeah, there's not a big difference, is it? HIV AIDS is just the starting point. It's HIV, it's a virus. The actual virus is AIDS. People around the globe were just as confused as I was. So I sought out the world's leading HIV AIDS authorities among whom were the discoverers of HIV, the key White House advisor on AIDS issues, and the executive director of UNAIDS Global Response to the Epidemic. Meeting with these distinguished experts, I candidly asked, what is the difference between HIV and AIDS? The difference between HIV and AIDS is a really critical concept, and unfortunately it's one that seems to escape a lot of people, or just they don't remember it after hearing it. HIV is a virus. AIDS is a syndrome caused by infection with the virus. So you don't get infected with AIDS, you get infected with HIV, and that causes AIDS. The biggest problem with the HIV theory of AIDS is HIV. There is a group of AIDS denialists that say that HIV does not exist and has never been isolated, um, which is <laughs> as, as bizarre as it gets. We do not say that HIV doesn't exist. What we say is, is that the presently available data does not prove the existence of HIV. 
The reality is that HIV does exist and does cause AIDS. I mean, the evidence is incontrovertible. HIV causes AIDS. All right, that's a theory that's there. Let that theory be there. But let's have some other conversations. Let's have some other research. Let's have some other funding. Maybe something else is working here. No. Why nearly three decades since its discovery does there continue to be debate over HIV? Why is there no cure in sight? To answer these questions, I needed context. The past is prologue, so my journey begins with a step back in time. The National Center for Disease Control is reporting more cases of two rare and deadly diseases found in homosexual men. There is no apparent explanation for the outbreak. Obviously, this is an issue with great emotional fervor, but... How can we stay unemotional afraid. when people are dying every day from a disease the CDC has yet to name? For crying out loud, if the CDC won't name it, at least demand the press stop calling it GRID. Well, unfortunately, I have to take credit uh, for coining the term GRID, which stood for gay-related immune deficiency. We were seeing a cluster of gay men who were suddenly critically ill of pneumocystis pneumonia, which was the indicator disease of something new, and reported our findings to the CDC. I was the chief of the STD division at the CDC at that time when the draft report of five cases of pneumocystis in gay men uh, came across my desk for review. Shortly afterward, cases of a very rare cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma were diagnosed in young gay men. My first reaction was, this is an extraordinarily important uh, finding. The CDC was looking for something like that when it came along. They were looking for it already. They were hoping there was going to be a new plague because polio was over. The CDC's budget was getting dec decreased. This is back in like the 19, early 80s. There was double-digit inflation, a very high unemployment, a rapid military buildup, and a threat to decrease um, all domestic programs. And this led to reductions in force in the public health service, particularly the CDC. The Center of Disease Control, CDC in Atlanta, was under threat for reduction and even theoretically for closure. There were memos around the CDC that says, we need to find a new plague. For them to justify their expenses and their existence and their, make their careers, they have to find infectious diseases. We need to find something that'll scare the American people so they won't want to give us more money. Once people recognized that this was likely caused by a virus, the media attention went from no news coverage to the most covered news story uh, in history. People went from neglecting it to fear and panic. Maybe I can get it. All of a sudden, AIDS was a very fundable project, and I suppose the psychology they worked on was the fact that they thought, well, in Congress, you, essentially this is white, straight, heterosexual men who are the congressmen. And if they feel they can't fuck around without you know, being worried about AIDS, they're going to let the dollars out. And it worked. Suddenly there was a lot of money available for anybody who wanted to study HIV. And nobody ever looked back and said, why do we want to study HIV? Bob Gallo said on television, causes AIDS. The evidence shows that this disease is not merely confined to the gay community. I motion to call the disease Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS. In 1982, Dr. Harry Haverkost was one of the Centers for Disease Control's epidemiologists tasked with defining AIDS. AIDS is, refers to a syndrome and its definition changes uh, periodically. AIDS is a chronic disease. It's based on its immunodeficiency. AIDS is not a disease, right? AIDS is a whole lot of different things. Depends on what country you're in. When your CD4 count falls below a certain arbitrary level, by definition, you have AIDS. You know, when someone's count goes down and then it goes back up again, it's, you know, politically they may still have AIDS. Medically, I don't think they do. If you develop any of a number of 
opportunistic infections or diseases, that puts you in the category of AIDS. We don't even know what AIDS is. AIDS is so hard to define because they change the definition of it every year. The definition of AIDS has broadened over time. It was revised in 1985, and then again in 1987. The changes in the definition have been political. Every time they change the definition, the numbers go up. The definition has changed many times. The biggest change was probably in 1993, which they then, you know, added the CD4 count uh, uh, and HIV. And, you know, you see, you could not even be ill, but if you had a CD4 count consistently below 200, you now had AIDS. A closer look at the Centers for Disease Control's documents reveals that AIDS numbers actually declined in 1993, but a retroactive definition change increased the estimates by more than 100 percent. The more diseases they could lump into this AIDS syndrome, S stands for syndrome, the better the chances are they get patients under that umbrella. The more patients they could catch. As time goes along, you know, definitions get used for a variety of, of issues, and some of those are not based solely on scientific decisions, but politics and capitalism and reimbursement comes into play. For example, a person with hepatitis C, even say here in San Francisco, if you've got hepatitis C and only hepatitis C, you're, you're shit out of luck. Having an AIDS diagnosis, you know, I get a free apartment. The city of San Diego pays my apartment. I can um, have the state of California pay for many um, medications related to HIV. Uh, I get Social Security benefits. I can get discounts on my supplements at the local health food store. I also get food stamps and in-home supportive cleaning services. So I was basically a healthy person walking around and yeah, I had all these wonderful little perks, you know? You get all these benefits, I mean, that, that we fought for and got, uh, but the end result has been a sort of an imbalance. I mean, we, we succeeded, I'm glad we did, but it is a little unfair. Politics, insurance, capitalism, benefits, you can be sick or healthy. I never would have thought that AIDS was so convoluted. <laughs> right, right. Well, as I said, that, 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 that has changed. How you define that scientifically has changed quite often, uh, which just makes it difficult to, you know, for, for the lay people to understand. It makes it difficult for me to interpret the numbers. Africa is purported to have the highest incidence of AIDS cases on the planet. So I trekked to South Africa to witness firsthand the impact of AIDS on that troubled continent. Around 10 million of South Africa's 48 million people have been reported to have AIDS. It's only a 10 minute drive from Cape Town's pristine modern airport to the squalor of neighborhoods said to be ravaged by AIDS. All the facts on HIV and AIDS with Griselda on Metro FM Talk. It's World AIDS Day. There are functions, there are gatherings. The international theme is Stop AIDS. Stop HIV and AIDS. Keep the promise. So many years later, we keep saying the same things. HIV, HIV, HIV. And yet... Each time I hear words like HIV and AIDS, I just want to pull my hair out. I'm just so fatigued about how we've packaged the messaging. All we talk about is AIDS. It's a sex virus. You have to use condoms or you die. It's a sick and sad message. People can't think outside AIDS anymore. And it's just a shocking, sad reality. The first AIDS meeting on the continent of Africa was in 1985 in, in Bangui. We were there with a few people who had experience on AIDS in Africa. And one of our problems was, how can you diagnose uh, AIDS in Africa in the absence of very sophisticated laboratory support. Even though by 1985 there was a HIV test, most of Africa didn't have access to it. So one of the things that we did in that meeting was to sit down and hash out the so-called Bangui criteria 
for the diagnosis of AIDS in Africa. The idea was what would be a simple way for a clinician to look at a patient and say that uh, this patient likely has AIDS. We say somebody who has a combination of certain um, signs and symptoms like major weight loss. And if you have a combination of that, you can say this is probably somebody with AIDS. They wanted a clinical case definition where they could decide that someone had AIDS just by looking at weight loss and persistent fever and so on. It gave something to clinicians in Africa to, uh, to diagnose AIDS. And that helped in the overall effort to count cases because we needed to know what was the impact of the, uh, of the epidemic. They could discover AIDS all over Africa at that point. They could say that we are all at risk, but they could say it's spreading around the world. They could say it affects women as much as men because almost anyone in an African hospital could be diagnosed with AIDS without having to do the HIV test at all. Whole nations have been led to believe that, in some instances, that they've got large percentages of their population infected and, and doomed because of this sexually transmitted, supposed sexually transmitted virus. It's such a tragedy. Daniel, Jumbo. A lot of people he, he, here is very sick and is very tired. What kind of sickness do you see around here? It's HIV AIDS. What is AIDS? We don't know. We don't know. So here you're living in a mud hut, and here some come a white man with doctors who you respect, and they tell you that there is now among you an invisible disease, that it, and it gets into your blood and can stay there unseen for years, and when it manifests itself, it's going to manifest itself in the forms of diseases you've always known. Maybe if you look skinny, if you lost uh, weight, maybe, they'll simply say hey, you have AIDS, or you're coughing a lot, maybe. They'll say you have the disease. This cannot help but create extraordinary paranoia in people's minds. They say, well, what is going on with us? My neighbor next door has got, he's got malaria. Is that, that, does that mean that he's, uh, that he's actually got this dreadful disease that, 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 that the whites are talking about? Like I could be fat now, then the mentality is that if ever I become teen, then it could be one of the symptoms. I have to ask myself, why now? Why at this time? Dr. Christian Fiala argues that many doctors have misused the Bangui definition. In the era before AIDS, we, we had to admit we don't know the diagnosis and we could hypothesize. But nowadays, um, what doctors do is, well, if we don't know what it is, it must be AIDS. We did have patients with uh, the conditions we now regard as AIDS-defining, even before the advent of AIDS. People could have TB and not have HIV and fulfill the Bangui criteria. They'd lose weight, they'd have TB, uh, and they could look like they have AIDS when they don't. Is this Bangui definition still being used today? I'm fairly certain that in many parts of Africa where there's still no, little or no testing available, that that definition is still used, and I wouldn't be surprised that it's used in the poorer parts of Asia. This word AIDS, I don't know what it is anymore. I don't know what we're talking about anymore when we talk about AIDS. AIDS is one thing in Greenwich Village and a very different thing in Kampala, Uganda. I visited the World Health Organization's website searching for answers and discovered there are currently more than 12 different definitions of AIDS worldwide. So I turned to Dr. James Chin, former head of the WHO's Global HIV Statistics Unit, for an explanation. In some countries, they felt they were a little more sophisticated than in others. And uh, you have, you know, along with the epidemic of HIV, uh, epidemics of HIV AIDS experts. And some of them will not necessarily uh, adhere to any international definition. They'll make up their own definition. High school biology class taught me that diseases and syndromes cannot differ from country to country like languages. It was becoming clear that HIV and AIDS were distinct, separate entities, and that AIDS was diverting my attention from the real culprit, HIV. Where to next? The place millions have had their lives changed forever. She says, we have your test result. You need to come in and get it. And I was like, tell me now, Cheryl. 
she was like, Kim, we really need you to come in and tell me. I said, then I know it's positive, Charlotte. You would just tell me over the phone. And she's like, Kim, don't panic. You can still have a normal life. I can still remember his face. I can remember his eyes. And all he said was, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I, I think you should put your affairs in order and you, you might have five years. I said, Cheryl, I have to get off the phone right now. I have to go tell my dad. He started crying. This isn't the way it happens in the movies. <laughs> It's 7 a.m. here in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm a little nervous because I'm about to go in for my first HIV test. Have you ever gone in for an HIV test? No. Uh, no. 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 Yes, I have actually, a few years ago. Were you nervous, apprehensive? I was, very frightened. The nearest testing center wasn't in a hospital or in a doctor's office, but on the main concourse of a bustling train station beneath a few portable tents. HIV testing facilities are everywhere, from street corner kiosks to shopping malls. I'll be tested with a rapid test, which looks for antibodies to HIV. So, have you ever tested before HIV before? No. Except no. Never. So first time. First time. Wow. Is this your questionnaire? Yes. Okay. These tests claim to be HIV tests. I'm going to read from a section that's called, that says limitations of the tests. The specificity of the reveal rapid HIV antibody test for blood specimens in low-risk populations has not been evaluated. They don't know, in their terms even, how well this test is going to work in people they don't want it to work in. Low risk. We don't think you're at risk. Tell me about this sex life. My sex life. Us? Um. Since you haven't exposed yourself, lack, sex, you're right. not homosexual, you're gay, you, you know your story. Yes. Let us go in. In 1990, we flew to Romania to adopt a baby. We found Lindsay, and she was only two weeks old. I can still remember that feeling, just holding Lindsay for the first time, thinking, now oh, my dream is going to come true. I'll have one of those children. Before we left Romania, we had to make sure that she didn't have HIV. We had to find a doctor, and he did the test, and it came back negative. We flew home just after Christmas, 1990, and um, I thought we had it made. So I'm going to do a test, which comprises of two test kits. These two test kits are from two different countries. While you are putting them being two, you want them to confirm each other. Can they be two different uh, outcomes? Then this one is a determiner, which is going to give us the final results. Can I just ask you something, as someone who's a little nervous, Okay. it seems like if this is positive no. and this is negative, yes. my life hangs in the balance on whatever this one is. Yes. But how do we know that this one's accurate when both of these were inaccurate? This one has been tested to be the one that is going to take out the results that are correct. Oh, so this one is more accurate than these two? Yes, according to what we have learned. So why don't we just use the more accurate one to begin with? Well, you know what? This, what if now the more accurate one has a discrepancy? How are you going to find out? I don't know. Rapid tests in Germany, it's not allowed for standard diagnostics. May I ask why, how come you don't use rapid tests for standard diagnostics? Several professional organizations who decide as an expert committee on guidelines how to okay. do things. None of these responsible uh, societies recommended for scientific reasons. We always say to our clients, even if you have tested here, you can go to other centers and go and test and verify your test. You cannot say you are 100%, because you find clients going from area to area doing tests, and they come with stories that I was negative at a certain area, I'm positive with you. How do they de decide whether they're positive or negative? We cannot tell, because we are using a rapid test. 
It occurred to me that perhaps the HIV epidemic is reported to be so widespread in South Africa and other poor nations simply because they use these inaccurate tests. There's the saying that if, if you knew how sausages, what sausages are made of, most people would hesitate to sort of eat them because they, they wouldn't like what's in it. And if you knew how HIV AIDS numbers are cooked uh, or made up, you would use them with extreme caution. I decided to investigate HIV testing protocols used throughout the developed world. When we're testing people for HIV, the first thing we do is a screening test, and it's usually a test called the ELISA. But there are also now available rapid assays that can be used as screening methods. Because they're faster. And we all know faster and cheaper is more efficient. If an ELISA is positive, it does not mean that the patient is HIV positive. That's a problem. If we're using antibodies as a screening test to tell who's infected or not, uh, uh, very occasionally you can get false positives. So screening tests by themselves should not be used as a definitive measure of infection. That's why we use a screening test to pick up all the cases, but we use a confirmatory test to eliminate any false positives. Take it easy. It should be emphasized that most of the developing world uses only screening tests to confirm an HIV diagnosis. There are no confirmatory tests. Time now is 25 past. At 22, the results will be out, which is going to be 15 minutes. Nine days after returning home, Stephen Sherrill's pediatrician ran a battery of tests on Lindsay, including an HIV test even though Lindsay had tested negative for the virus in Romania. Dr. McHugh called us and said, we run into some problems with the test, the testing that you did at, at Methodist Hospital, and you'll need to come right in and see me. I said, well, what is it? She says, well, I can't, I'm not gonna tell you over the phone. I said, I need to know exactly what this is. He said, you know, we've got bad news that, that she tests positive. And he said, she'll have a 20% chance of living to age two. That was just a shock, just a shock after all this joy and happiness. We finally found our daughter and I'm dancing around Romania and now I come home and it's like somebody could just stab me. And then I had to call my mom and that was the, the worst phone call I've ever had to make because I, I even remember saying that poor girl, she's just not gonna make it. So that we don't have to go to somebody and say, well, you might be infected, but it might be a false positive. We do a second test. That's a test usually called the Western blot. In 1992, when I was told by my doctor that I was HIV positive, that was only a verbal admission to me. She didn't give me the written paper that came from the lab that tested my blood. I found out that it says this indicates possible infection by virus there can be mistakes from the antibody test. And there are conditions that can cause the test to be inaccurate. Now that I've got the package insert for that test kit, it says positive results using any specimen type should be followed with additional testing. But this is the test that they use to confirm with. This has a margin of error done properly that's extremely low. In other words, it's one of medicine's better tests. I don't think the Western blot is a useful diagnostic test. I don't think it's worth doing. Did he give a reason? You know, anybody can say anything. I think it's stupid to drive a car. He but come on, you got to give a reason. It's a useful prognostic test. Once you know that someone is infected, then you can follow their antibody response as well with Western blots. It says absolutely wrong. It has a complete usefulness. You don't need a Western blot. And it's become a dogma in HIV research that you need one ELISA followed by a Western. You don't. You need two different kinds of ELISAs made in two different formats. Would you ever want to confirm somebody is positive using just ELISAs? No, never. Okay. It's not, it's against the rules. It's against the recommendations. It's a turbulent sea of, of argument about how can we use this test? When can we use this test? Why does this test have no standard? We have a group now of about 40 patients that have no detectable virus. 
in their body, but they're not being treated. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, are they really infected? So the Western blots can have false positives? No, the Western blot was negative, too. But they were told they were positive by a lab, yes, that misread the Western blot. Heavyweight champion Tommy Morrison tested positive in 1996. Eleven years later, in 2007, he tested negative multiple times, allowing him to return to the ring. There's constant discussion in the community of people who do diagnostic testing and the blood bankers about how to read these tests. When you're looking at this, this Western blood, how do you determine what is a positive? You need a certain number of bands being present. It depends a little bit on the producer of the test. It depends on the manufacturer. Is, yeah. is there different criteria for what might be a positive? Yeah, there are different criteria from the manufacturer. <laughs> Thank you for the word. And also um, there are guidelines from the WHO and UNAIDS. Well, HIV infection is diagnosed with uh, rather now routine laboratory tests, which, um, uh, for which the, there are criteria for diagnosis uh, established by the manufacturer, <laughs> FDA. Claudia showed me the package insert that comes with the Western blot. It contains eight different sets of criteria for diagnosing HIV infection. Because of the different criteria that apply in different countries, you can be considered, you can test HIV positive in one country and be given an AIDS diagnosis as a result of that, whereas in another country you won't test HIV positive and you won't be given an, an AIDS diagnosis. It's ludicrous that you can be positive in one country and not positive in another. Theoretically, I could be diagnosed with AIDS in the United States, but if I take three steps to my right, I wouldn't be diagnosed with AIDS, or I would lose my AIDS diagnosis when I crossed the border. In 1992, I was encouraged by a doctor to take what's called an HIV test as a matter of social responsibility. And I was shocked and devastated and horrified when the results came back positive. It was one of those moments that everyone fears their whole life. A week later, I take the same test to an AIDS specialist. He looks and says, this isn't a positive test. I don't know what this test means. Since a false positive looks like a true positive, how can you ever distinguish whether it's truly a positive or a negative? Well, that's a great question. Um, it's going to be very hard to determine uh, a false positive. So I take the test again, and this time my results come back marked from the lab indeterminate. I'm faced with the decision, do I want to wait six weeks to test again or do it right away? I opted for right away. My results that time come back positive. Took it again, came back negative. I took it again, positive. What happens if you're positive on one criteria but negative on another manufacturer's criteria? How do you decide uh, who's infected and who's not? Um, you, you will use the less, uh, the most sensitive criterion. In late December of 2007, I read about new legislation passed in New Jersey calling for the mandatory testing of pregnant women or newborn infants should the mother's status be unknown. HIV mandatory testing, to me, is a no-brainer. I'm very much opposed to the concept of mandatory testing of any population because the tests are scientifically shown to be unreliable and inaccurate. You have no reason to fear this bill. And my hope is that eventually this will become a federal law so that every woman in this country would be tested. But well, HIV testing isn't an absolutely precise science. When I confronted my doctor about that, she said, we're way past Western blot now. We have the viral load test. But when you get the package insert for the viral load test, it says... If you test positive, you are considered confirmed infected with HIV. But at the bottom of the page, in fine print, it states a person should have additional testing. 
It does not allow you to tell a single person on this planet that they are HIV positive. And it's a scandal that this test continues to be used. So again, I'm asking, where's the test? Where's the test that can confirm a diagnosis of HIV infection? And I can't find one. I have the package insert from the manufacturer which they supplied me with. And under limitations of the test, it states that risk factors should be used in conjunction with the test. Has a person had sex? Uh, have they used drugs? Have they had a blood transfusion? And then in conjunction with the test, not the test alone, but with the test, then you decide whether the person is positive or negative. Did the answers to these questions help aid in the diagnosis? Oh, of course they did. Really? They do. Now, if I tell you that the test you took was lousy and didn't mean a thing, does that make any difference for everybody to hear? You make a difference for me. Yeah, I know. How can we say that HIV is the cause of AIDS when we don't know, based on current tests, whether or not anybody diagnosed positive actually has HIV? President Thabo Mbeki will officially open the AIDS conference tonight. Delegates here are hoping he will finally separate himself from the AIDS denialists. We remain convinced of the need for us better to understand what would constitute a comprehensive response in a context such as ours, which is characterized by high levels of poverty and disease. As I listened and heard the whole story told about our own country, it seemed to me that we could not blame everything on a single virus. I thought this man must be an idiot. Everyone in Africa is dying of AIDS. I know this because I read the New York Times. It's beyond doubt. Rion Milan was hired by Rolling Stone to investigate and debunk President Mbeki's misguided ideas. Where to begin? The numbers. My very first action, I opened Johannesburg's yellow pages. I thought that I could illustrate this with a scene that began in, in, a, in, in a coffin factory in Johannesburg, where workers are working overtime trying to create caskets for these massive, these mountains of people who are dying of this condition. And I, I discover that in the midst of what UNAIDS says is a plague, is that half of the coffin factories in Johannesburg have gone bankrupt. In South Africa alone, it's about a thousand people dying every day from AIDS. If you're an advocacy agency and you perceive low numbers to be bad, uh, your bias may be to accept higher numbers even if uh, they're not scientifically sound. I know Jim Chin quite well, and I was the chairman of the uh, uh, steering committee on epidemiology of uh, the global program on AIDS in WHO, when Jim Chin was in charge of epidemiologic estimates. And we could never get information how the WHO estimates were made then. So we were very critical in these days um, because we felt it was not based on uh, enough evidence. It's possible that uh, he didn't read the materials we sent him or he didn't understand them, but we did send information to uh, anybody that wanted to know about the estimates because they were pretty transparent. In an attempt to get to the bottom of the statistics debate, I've come to Geneva, Switzerland to look at the World Health Organization's official numbers. And what we found, there are no numbers, only assumptions and estimates. How are the monies divvied out the states for AIDS prevention or AIDS treatment? How is government monies sent out to different states and communities? The more AIDS you have, the more money you get. Exactly. The AIDS blindness have a vested interest in maximizing and squeezing the data to get the worst possible scenario that they can out of it because the worse the situation is, the more compelling their fundraising claims are. When UNAIDS was uh, created, about $250 million was spent on AIDS in poor countries. Ten years later, it's $10 billion. That's an unprecedented increase, still not enough. When that was created, the first thing Peter Piat said, and said was that UNAIDS is an advocacy agency, pure and simple. And this was my first objective when I came into this job, and that was put it on the political agenda. He divested himself of all of the program aspects and the scientific aspects of, of, of AIDS. This is not a scientific issue. This is a matter of politics. Except one unit. He kept sort of the numbers unit. 
we are really uh, doing a major disservice to say it is uh, not as bad as it looks like, because actually it is much worse. One month after my interview with Dr. Piat, the Indian government slashed their estimates by nearly 60%. Shortly thereafter, UN aides acknowledged they'd been overestimating global HIV statistics for more than a decade. They've painted themselves into a corner, and now the, the, their house of numbers is falling apart. America is leading the fight against disease. And I call on you to double our initial commitment to fighting HIV AIDS by approving an additional $30 billion over the next five years. Noble corruption, misuse of statistics, in order to convince people that there's one hell of a problem out there, guys, and we've got to go and do something about it. If you look at the real world, you know, how many people are infected, diagnosed to be infected, and uh, eligible for treatment. There are very few compared to the number. In April of 2008, Congress approved a $50 billion expenditure for AIDS treatment and prevention. The vast majority of the uh, world's population is not at any measurable risk of HIV infection. No measurable risk. Growing up in the age of AIDS, I was taught there were three certainties in life, death, taxes, and contracting HIV from unprotected sex. If you don't use a condom, there's a lot of chances that you can actually get the killer disease that is AIDS. I did a study of the heterosexual transmission of HIV in California, and we recruited individuals who were infected with HIV. Then we recruited their sexual partners, and we looked at whether transmission, in fact, had occurred. Hadian runs a study, it's a 10-year study, with the world's most virulent, terrifying sexually trained... I mean, this thing jumps, excuse me, off of penises into vaginas miles away. How many of them do you think, after 10 years, with the world's most terrifying, virulent, sexually transmitted disease came up positive? Not nobody. Nobody. Nobody who was negative came up positive. Zero. I think HIV is more difficult to transmit than other sexually than a lot of probably most other sexually transmitted diseases. I mean, I think that's pretty widely known. If I were to have unprotected sex with somebody who is HIV positive, how many acts would I have to engage in before I got the virus? Just one. Just one. I assume one would be enough. The first act. One is enough. Remarkably, HIV is a difficult infection to transmit. This contradicts everything I was ever taught about the sexual transmission of HIV. AIDS is the best example of what's really scary and alarming and dangerous about our culture right now, which is that it's a culture of, of PR. It's a public relations phenomenon. The truth doesn't matter. What matters is the image. If we were talking about reality, the reality is that AIDS is over. Somebody decided in the early 80s that there's this infection called HIV. And upon deciding that, I don't think it was debated enough in 1983, Dr. Luc Montagnier and his team of researchers identified what they thought might be the cause of AIDS. I really was excited because we knew it was a new type of virus, not shown before in men, and very likely to be the cause of AIDS. Of course, at that time, we didn't have the full proof of what's the cause of AIDS. That initial work was rapidly reinforced by um, additional virology and serology studies in, in Bob Gallo's lab in Washington. Now we got pushed by the Reagan administration that wanted to do something on AIDS finally. They literally told us to just close CDC's lab down. We, we don't care about it. There's a bunch of gays who gives a shit. I and mean, that was really their, their whole story. So the whole thing that they rested their political response was, well, we discovered the virus. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The probable cause of AIDS has been found. Credit must go to our 
eminent Dr. Robert Gallo, who directed the research that produced this discovery. What was new that day is for the first time we were saying, that's the cause, I'm sure. It was a silly press conference. There was not evidence then that HIV was the cause of AIDS. It wasn't called HIV. There was certainly evidence that he didn't discover it. It was discovered in France. The conference was held before any of Robert Gallo's papers were published, therefore before any other scientist had a chance to review them and uh, look at the evidence and see if he got it right or wrong. Gallo's philosophy was to have people to whom he would give the virus be in his own control so that any information that came out of that was, would come through him so that he got all the information, indeed often put his name on publications and would, quote, collaborate with them. But should you have any broader view other than his personal glory and your personal glory, it, it, this was not a scientific pursuit in any way. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services decided from now on, we are only going to fund AIDS research that assumes that Robert Gallo's virus is the cause. I didn't think that uh, HIV in 1984 was the cause of AIDS. That's why I did the study comparing gay men with Kaposi's and gay men with pneumocystis. I assume there must be something else. If you go read my paper from 1985 that Kern and Jaffe would not sign on to, I actually lay out the cofactor hypothesis in that paper. I'm a promoter of, of the role of cofactors. Uh, in the uh, AIDS? Well, cofactors just says that the cause of a disease is uh, by more than one factor. Just simply being infected with HIV is not going to do it. You need certain cofactors. Cofactors are not necessary. Dr. Fauci would say HIV causes AIDS without the need for anything else. That's kind of ridiculous. The data that indicate that any different type of infection, like mycoplasma or something like that, is a necessary cofactor. I believe those theories have been debunked. What the fuck does he mean? There's, sorry. What's it? Uh, same story the kind of, <laughs> What does he mean that there are no cofactors? Where's he coming from? There's cofactors for everything. Cofactor implies something specific, and it and it really gets us off into tracks that are wandering. Gallo uh, isn't gonna is it gonna change his mind? But he's probably seventy years plus now. He's going to remember things that yeah, we all remember things that are good for us. And we forget the bad things. The cofactors are important to really understand how people get ill, why they get ill. What is asked of an AIDS journalist is to deny an existing reality, which is a strong, growing body of dissent on a scientific question. In August of um, 92, my dad had just read his latest National Review, and um, there was an article in there about Peter Duisberg, a maverick cell biologist. He said he didn't think HIV caused AIDS. To deny that this well-identified, well-characterized virus is linked with AIDS is, to my mind, just potty. He said, I can't replicate this in my office. I can't get this virus to do anything. We thought, oh my gosh, my dad is already daydreaming. He's trying to wish this all away because he knows how upset we are. Just, just wish it all away and you know, everybody will be gone happy. If Fauci would say, here's a billion dollar for alternative theories of AIDS, you wouldn't believe what's going to happen. A lot of HIV researchers overnight would find of, of would start cofactors. The first year they would call them cofactors of HIV, and the next year the co would be topped and HIV would be topped a year later. Peter is highly intelligent. He did excellent work. I mean, no wonder he got a full professorship in Berkeley and was nominated to the American Academy of Sciences. But I told you very frankly that he's killing people with his theories, and I still stick to that. They attack him, they attack his ideas, and they don't, and they, they present some bogus way of refuting what his science has said that doesn't really refute it. Peter Duisberg? Yes. Oh. 
They are all prostitutes, most of them, my colleagues, to some degree, even myself. You have to be prostitute to get money for your research. You're trained a little bit to be a prostitute. Mm. But some go all the way. <laughs> In light of all this scientific uncertainty, I asked Dr. Fauci for evidence linking HIV to immune deficiency disease. When you put the combined findings of the initial characterization as a distinct retrovirus isolated by Montagnier and his group, together with Gallo linking the virus to being the cause of AIDS, and they put those things together, and that's how we have a confirmation of the causative agent of, H of, of AIDS, namely HIV. Still unclear about the evidence for HIV's existence, I decided the best way to verify it would be to actually see it. I asked Dr. Hans Gelderblum, a world-renowned electron microscopist, if he thought there was any reason to question Dr. Montagnier's published images. I've seen these publications, stamp-sized images. It's a nuisance. It's a nuisance. You do not really see much. When we saw that photo, we said, mm, suggestive, but not convincing. Dr. Gallo, one year later, published photographs he claimed to be of HIV. Were his any better? These pictures were not so uh, impressive. They were not much better than Montagnier's images. It's one thing to look like, and another thing is to be a virus. In 2002, I stumbled across an article by Valander Turner and Andrew McIntyre of the Perth Group in Australia, and it questioned whether there's ever even been found a virus. I became consumed with researching this. I could read from morning till night, morning till night, every day, and every link to another link, and I would email to these people and say, where's the test? I want to know. Am I dying? Am I contagious? And they weren't even very kind. They were just like, read our articles again. How many times do we have to tell you there's no test? It is crucial to understand that an AIDS diagnosis is forever. It cannot be reversed or alleviated. The stigma attached to people knowing that you have it and are living with it is worse than actually living with it. I can't think of anybody who's ever been evicted from their apartment because they had breast cancer or because they had cerebral palsy. I did a campaign to address stigma. The message is that if anyone is infected, we are all affected. Some have it medically, some have it socially, some have it culturally. Um, and at the end of the day, if it exists anywhere, it exists everywhere. We don't all have AIDS. And once you start bullshitting, it gets a problem, you know? We don't all have AIDS. We all have to be sympathetic to AIDS. And yes, there's all kinds of people who get HIV infection. But you know, we don't need to make, in my view, non-truths, you know, or just to have a slogan or a symbol. We all have AIDS, no? We don't all have AIDS. But my message is you do have it. Whether you want to accept it or not, are you medically susceptible? Maybe not. Um, but are you socially um, vulnerable? Yes. In June of 2007, the BBC featured a news story which began HIV Infection Theory Challenged. Living cells are complicated and how they work inside the body is even more complicated. So there is still a lot of debate uh, as to how exactly HIV causes AIDS. In March of 2008, the Washington Post went on to state that multiple surprises have reminded researchers how much they still don't know about HIV's biology. HIV has got to get inside the circulation of the body. And it does that in ways that are not completely understood. The prime target for HIV is a T cell population called CD4 helper T cells. The way that the virus gets into the target cell, it fuses its membrane to the membrane of the cell. I don't understand the fusion process. I don't think anybody completely understands it. We have a relatively poor understanding of how viral proteins interact with proteins in the cell. How come our antibodies aren't able to keep HIV in check? It's an excellent question that's one of the great stumbling blocks. 
They can't prove that HIV is the cause of AIDS. Okay? They cannot prove that HIV is the cause of the collapse of the immune system, no matter how many scientific journals says it is. When you go to the basic research, it doesn't prove it. We are almost convinced that there is other factors uh, that are involved in the loss of CD4 cells, and we don't know yet all the mechanism. How HIV depletes the T cells so an individual advances to AIDS is uh, probably due to multifactorial elements. One is it will kill the cell eventually that it infects. HIV does not necessarily kill the cells it infects. Some T cells are directly killed by HIV, and other T cells keep the virus in check. It's a silent state within the cell. And I think uh, in some, some, many cases, these cells can return to a normal function. Can that cell return to a normal state? Uh, I don't think so. When I was told I was HIV positive, I accepted that on a very deep level. But only by having the courage the open minds and the open hearts to answer these questions. Are we ever going to know how to help people, how to do what we need to do to help people? In late 2007, Science Daily reported that three prominent research teams had published papers in the Journal of Immunology challenging the theory that the sudden loss of T-cells triggers disease and AIDS. The details of HIV pathogenesis, how HIV kills people, are still being worked out. If the sudden loss of T-cells in HIV-positive individuals can't explain why people get disease, then there must be cofactors that cause people to get sick and die, or factors that have absolutely nothing to do with HIV. While researching HIV hotspots, I began to realize there is a direct correlation in these places with another condition that leads to immune deficiency and death. I think it is important to keep in mind, especially for us in the West, that poverty is not a romantic issue. It is a deadly issue. Poverty leads to diseases and premature death, period. When you look at the symptoms that they talk about, you know, for people that are HIV positive, you find that some of them, they are more related to malnutrition. The nutrition is not very equilibrated. They are in oxidative stress, even they are not infected with HIV. So their immune system doesn't work well already. People are hungry, they're underdeveloped, there are no hospitals, there's no proper medical care. You take away poverty, you, you're giving people an ability to fight infections. These are toilets? Yeah. We don't have flushing toilets. When flies get into the toilets, they actually can come back to, 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 to touch our food, you see. And, and, and look, we need to take that food. And we don't know which infections are there. How do you expect people must, must survive in these places? Look there. How many white people they are staying in this house like this one? In Cape Town is different. You go to suburbs, you see the suburbs are different from our places. Why have we done nothing for African people, just like give them clean water so they don't die in infancy of diarrheal disease and stuff like this? All we care about is HIV AIDS. Well, question. Well, there's money in it. There has to be you know other dynamic working to lead public interests to the African situation and ignore clean water, sanitation, malaria, I mean things that kill people. This is the beginning of a war. It is, it is a war to reclaim our health. In 2008, USA Today published a news story that stated, if we look at the data objectively, we are spending too much on AIDS. About $10 billion a year is spent on AIDS, while 2 billion people live with no sanitation. 1 billion lack access to clean water. And malnutrition kills someone every 10 seconds. 
These factors enable diseases to thrive and severely weaken the immune system of those living in such squalor. And if we were to take all that money and put it towards developing poor countries, God would be so proud of us, indeed, because we would have taken away the major challenge that's facing humankind, and that is people dying in silence. It's slow, painful deaths from being scared of something that was just packaged as, as, as eight. Could it be that the real epidemic is extreme poverty, not HIV? On the other hand, HIV allegedly occurs in the United States as well. So I looked for alternative causes of immunodeficiency in this wealthiest of nations. There are other ways you could produce a condition that looks like AIDS, but they too will be some source that causes a severe uh, defect in the immune response. 19 million Americans now, 19 million, are taking illicit drugs every day. But we don't talk about this. This is politically incorrect. There have been a number of theories as to what the origin of HIV AIDS is. One of them was a theory that certainly turned out to be completely incorrect, that it's a lifestyle phenomenon. There's a large epidemic of STDs in general in the late 70s, and particularly in gay men in San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, were meccas of the new lifestyle, which came from the liberation in the post-Stonewall era. The more partners you could have, the more you were striking a blow for gay lib. I remember talking to one of the people who was at the forefront of that lifestyle. He very much felt like if he did have another bout of syphilis or gonorrhea, whatever it might be, that it was like a notch, another a victory notched up for his right to exist as a gay man. I went on a vacation to Los Angeles, and it wasn't that wild, but I, one night I went to a bathhouse. I came home with, get this, at the same time, syphilis, gonorrhea, and two forms of parasites. I have no views about that, you know, in a judgmental kind of sense, but certainly from a public health point of view, that's kind of a, uh, a prescription for disaster because AIDS first occurred in these men who were not healthy for reasons that were obvious to everyone. You're talking thousands of partners, sometimes hundreds, you know, per month, lots of antibiotic use, lots of um, drug use, and you know, the result were people were getting pretty sick. There's a drug called amyl nitrate that was developed in the 1850s and 60s. Came in ampules and they became known as poppers because you'd pop them when you open these ampules up to sniff them when you had coronary artery disease. The first AIDS cases, for example, that Mike Gottlieb reported uh, were all five gay men. They were young. They all used poppers. Poppers. Something you walk around huffing all night. I mean, it, it says flammable, uh, fatal if swallowed on the side of the bottle. They're walking around huffing it all night long. Why? Gives you a great rush. Poppers was a sex drug. They were in every gay bathhouse, every bar, every porno bookstore across the nation. Poppers were visible on the dance floor in the discos. At the end of an evening, the bartender would announce, last call for alcohol, last call for poppers. It was like a mad, wonderful kind of a dance that was being done. But if you think that can happen, forever, you're wrong. Whether or not HIV exists, whether its, its role in a weakened immune system is almost irrelevant when you compare it to what was going on at that time. The lifestyle um, explanation proved politically unacceptable, but the virus explanation proved, proved very, very acceptable to many different parties. Pneumocystis pneumonia and Kaposi's sarcoma were the hallmark diseases for AIDS in the early years. To go back and deconstruct it and say, what exactly did cause pneumocystis carinia? I remember the first patient that I ever saw, my resident brought me to see a, a young gay man with pneumocystis pneumonia. I knew a little bit about the use of poppers or amyl nitride inhalants. And I started asking the patient if he used them, and it turned out that he was a very heavy user 
of amyl nitrites. And much to the surprise of my students, I said, I think the man probably has destroyed his pulmonary immune system by inhaling this toxin. What exactly caused Kaposi's sarcoma? We know that now. It was amyl nitrite. We saw KS decline, interestingly parallel to the decline in pauper use. We now know that Kaposi's sarcoma is caused by a second virus, the human herpes virus, strain eight. To rescue comes another virus. As always, when you need, when you're in trouble, you find another virus. If one wants to look uh, at really what causes this, we've got to look beyond uh, just HIV and just beyond HHV8. Calling it a disease, see? And to give it that name, AIDS. So everything's included under that, and you don't have to just say, I mean, if you just said, you know, these people are getting a lot of weird diseases, all kinds of diseases, it wouldn't have had the same impact. It was much better to say there is a infectious organism on the loose in America, and it could get you. I had interviewed the world's leading HIV experts and discovered that the two benchmark diseases of AIDS have alternate explanations. Once again, I turned to Dr. Gelderblom, seeking proof of HIV's existence in the most recent images available. Here, you do not see anything about uh, the details, but I would say it's probably a virus. These are HIV here? Yeah. Oh, the, so the, are the, these HIV too? Yeah, yeah. Everything's probably, HIV? Probably. Probably. Yeah. What can I tell you? You know, it, it, I mean, it, it exists. <laughs> yeah, well, said he had all these viruses, and it was a lie. I think HIV totally has turned out not to be the cause of AIDS. HIV has turned out not to be. Gelderblum's images, said to come from isolated HIV cultures, provided no proof for HIV's existence. So I asked Nobel laureate Dr. David Baltimore and Dr. Robin Weiss how they would isolate and photograph this elusive virus. Well, I didn't Dr. Gallo do that? I mean, he actually isolated it, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why should I do all of this? This is all textbook stuff you're asking me. I'm not quite sure what's behind your question about isolation. I don't want to be your textbook. You know, okay. I got other things to do. They're embarrassed. The scientists have been embarrassed about this. They know that it's flawed. In 1987, the CDC made two mind-boggling changes in the definition of AIDS, which are in effect today. You can be diagnosed with AIDS without ever having an HIV test. In 1987, I had a lesion on my arm, and it was KS, <clears throat> Kaposi sarcoma. The doctor diagnosed you with AIDS without an HIV test? Yeah. You can be diagnosed with AIDS if you've tested negative for HIV. Alvin Friedman Keene found 16 patients with Kaposi sarcoma among gay men in New York City in the 80s. They did not have HIV infection. Yet they had AIDS by our definition, right? In a World Health Organization publication, Dr. Chin writes, it should be emphasized that the surveillance definitions for AIDS were not intended to be reliable indicators of HIV infection. If you have thousands of documented cases of AIDS without HIV, how can HIV cause AIDS? Why do you believe that HIV does cause AIDS? Because that's all the information that I've been given. Because we've never been taught anything different. We have uh, read it, heard it. Because that's what the scientific community has told us. Scientists are supposed to observe, experiment, and reason from what they observe. They're not supposed to grab hold of an idea and cling to it and adjust everything else in their perceptions to fit that idea. I think an HIV positive test means that your life is forever changed. You have a whole new battery of things to consider for yourself. What does it mean to me? It's very um, hard to find anyone who supports you when you say, I don't think I'm going to die of HIV or AIDS. This, the typical model of HIV equals AIDS equals death, uh, how invested am I going to be in that model? Everyone who's infected with HIV would like to deny it. I mean, it's a bad 
prognosis. It means you're going to take drugs for the rest of your life, et cetera, et cetera. So there's people who want to say, ah, I'm one of the people who tested positive, but I'm not going to get the disease. Do I start treatment? Treatment meaning the antiviral drugs, if ever? We started taking Lindsay to a doctor at the Children's Medical Clinic. She gave us a prescription for uh, retrovir syrup, which is AZT. It was so important for us to get something to help our baby that we sat on the floor in the pharmacy and gave her her first dose. Shortly after Lindsay began AZT treatment, side effects began to emerge. Her eating habits changed quite a bit. She didn't eat well. She was hard to handle at the table. And then the leg cramps started. Once that started, it got progressively worse. She would just grab him and go, oh, you know, screaming in the middle of the night. Just like it was a, it wasn't an ache, it was like, must have been sharp pains. It's just, just made you feel sick to your stomach. Any drug active on the HIV would be toxic because it's not 100% specific of the HIV enzymes. When we switched over to the university, then the dosage of AZT went up, and that's where she started flattening out on her uh, growth chart. The doctors would try to put a, a positive spin on how well she was progressing. It was, it was mainly in the T cells that weren't always a positive situation. Yeah, the T cell count would go down, and then the doctors would say, well, maybe we better raise that AZT dosage, get that T cell count back up. We were going, I think it's kind of making her sick because she doesn't want to eat. She's having leg cramps. And they'd say, well, it's the HIV, and that's what it does. It's all part of the package. The treatment causes uh, a very similar condition we would expect from an AIDS patient. That's why nobody noticed that there was something wrong with the treatment. I remember in 1992, after I first tested positive, I became involved in an organization called Women at Risk. There were 11 of us at the time on the board and involved in the group. All of us except three were on the medications. In the year and a half that I was involved with Women at Risk, every single woman in that organization on the drugs died, every single one except the three of us who weren't taking them. We weren't just given handfuls of AZT, we demanded it. AZT should be free. Where is your humanity? We considered the FDA not giving us these things as being anti-gay instead of being responsible. And so we went and we lobbied and we pushed for all these things. And we didn't think clearly about what it was we were asking for. It's like that saying, be, caref be careful what you ask for, it may come to pass. That's the very reason why everybody believed HIV is a deadly virus, because the HIV-positive patient at that time got a deadly treatment. Despite the billions spent on the drug, tens of thousands of people with AIDS have died. And now a growing number of studies are questioning the drug's usefulness. We just decided between ourselves in, um, in November to write to Peter Duisberg and say, sorry to bother you. Are you for real? And if Lindsay were your daughter, what would you do? On November 11th, we got a big package. And he said, you must take your daughter off AZT immediately or she will die from it like Kimberly Bagalis. That is AIDS by prescription. You get immunodeficiency and you die from the tox. That is AIDS by prescription. When AZT became widely available in, in 1985 and 1986, uh, I cautioned my patients not to jump on the bandwagon and start being treated. I didn't want to see my community poisoned by an ineffective therapy. I think in retrospect, the dose that we started with, with AZT, was uh, a dangerous and uh, poorly tolerated dose. Nobody wants to realize uh, what what was the real effect of this overtreatment? That means that we killed a whole generation of AIDS patients. It 
in 96, David Ho announced highly active antiretroviral therapy. Also known as the cocktail because the treatment combined the newly developed protease inhibitors with older HIV drugs, such as the chemotherapy drug AZT. That was a revolution. What was a 100% um, fatal illness now could be treated. The AIDS medication today is not that toxic than it was in the early days. And it's a potent uh, drug regime that means it kills almost everything. I play around with treatment interruption because I think the drugs are toxic. And if I do the drugs continuously without interruption, I think that they'll have a cumulative um, damage. In the years that we've been using the cocktail, we've found that there are lots of side effects. In South Africa, I spoke to a couple of pharmacists specializing in HIV treatment. How often do you see side effects in patients? Yeah. All the time? Yeah, all the time. Almost all the time. We saw the lipodystrophy, the buffalo humps at the back of the neck, then the lipoatrophy, which is the loss of fat in the face and the arms, giving people a very gaunt look. The risk of heart attack seems to be increased in people on these drugs. Uh, with what we have now, the side effects eventually are going to outweigh the benefits. So uh, patients really do better for the short term, but in the long term, they, uh, they die also. In 1994, Audrey Serrano tested HIV positive. While initially healthy, she was prescribed AIDS drugs, which nearly killed her and left her scarred for life. In December 2007, after multiple negative tests, she was awarded $2.5 million in damages. Some people are very fortunate. They don't have these side effects, but many people do. So prolonged treatment is impossible. I know people that are like horses, have no impact with some drugs, no side effects, and somebody else falls apart. The new uh, generation of uh, antiretroviral drugs are less toxic. They can be more t tolerated. But for how long? This, I agree. We cannot give a treatment for life. It's, it's not like insulin, you know, it's, uh, it's something which is toxic. Has a patient ever died from the side effects? Yeah, you know, sometimes, sometimes it happens. AIDS drugs are all classified as black box drugs. A black box drug is the, the most severe warning that our FDA will put on a product. It means you could die taking this because other people have died taking this. My sister Joyce was my best friend. She's a great mom and uh, just a very lively person. In 2003, Joyce found out she was pregnant with a second child. She was offered an HIV test as standard prenatal care by her obstetrician. She called me at work, and she was like, I got something to tell you. And I was like, well, what is it? She said, I'm HIV positive. So I took a deep breath. I said, well, it's not the end of the world. And she said, well, now I met this doctor today, and he's a specialist. And he says, is there some medicines I can take that'll keep my baby from being HIV positive? Nevirapine. Warning. Severe life-threatening skin reactions, including fatal cases. One morning, she was covered in these welts and this rash. It was all over her face. It was all over the, her chest, all over her arms, her hands. When they're talking about a rash that can kill you, they're talking about a, a drug that targets the, the actively replicating cells in your dermis, in, in your mucosal layers, in your intestine, and, and stops them from working. And what happens? Good, goodbye skin. I would never take them. I, I look at, I, I, I don't have a problem with other people taking them. But I, as Chriselda Kananda personally, looking at the side effects that they come with, looking at the toxins that they, they, they uh, present in my body, not now, not ever. I have patients tested in 1985. They were all advised to take treatment, but they declined the treatment for different reasons. Because they didn't want to take toxic drugs because they were feeling well at that time. 
And how are they doing today? They're still living. Healthy? Yeah. Once we came to the conclusion that this was the drug that was causing this problem, irregardless of what the HIV was going to do, she was going to come off the drug no matter what. If taking her off the drugs meant that she could sleep through the night and be happy for six months, that would be worth it, rather than live in agony for two years or 12 months. You hear a lot of doctors, you hear a lot of educators in age, you hear a lot of people talk about, it is probably the drugs that are gonna kill us before the disease does. What are the drugs doing to the bodies? They're putting the bodies into coffins. Before my sister started taking the drugs, she was healthy. After she took, started the drugs, she developed an allergic reaction, which made her look like a patient with full-blown AIDS. She was admitted to the hospital. She continued to spiral down. And within 37 days from her first date of taking the medicine, she was gone. When news of Joyce's death reached the NIH, emails were exchanged between the director of the AIDS division and an ethics and safety officer. Ed, there was fulminant liver failure resulting in the death on this trial last week. Ouch, not much we can do about dumb docs. They're cynical enough to introduce drugs that they know will have toxic effects and will carry a certain mortality, and they know that the, the life of the drug before this mortality becomes too obvious to ignore is, say, two or three years, and they work out what the sales are going to be in those two or three years, and then they know they're going to have to reduce the dose. Joyce has two sons. Jamal will be, he's in his senior year of high school this year. Sterling will be four years old. And in my mind, they were robbed of their mother. If someone's going to be giving me a diagnosis of certain death in five to seven years, I want scientific proof. This isn't a religion. My interest in, in questioning and breaking and in, in, in exploring does HIV cause AIDS is an instinct to liberate people from a death sentence that isn't theirs to carry. After we took Lindsay off AZT, her weight did go up. Within a couple of days, the leg cramps went away. And her physical body seemed to be doing pretty well, but it was like she was disturbed. She was agitated very easily. Her lifespan changed all the time after she got to be two years old, and then she'd only lived to be five. Hi. When she got to be a little older, then they said, oh, she might live to be seven. Yep. <laughs> but definitely wouldn't live into double digits. And mm -mm. it was, that's just was our life then. Although Lindsay was on AZT for 22 months, she made a full recovery from the pernicious side effects. Lindsay will be 19 in October of 2009. Because it's been surrounded from day one with so much emotion, so much fear, so much psychology, so much drama, very few people are capable of looking at AIDS logically. We can be exposed to HIV many times without being chronically infected. Our immune system could get rid of virus within a few weeks if you have a good immune system. If you have a good immune system, then your body can naturally get rid of HIV. Yes. If you take a poor African who's been infected and you build up their immune system, is it possible for them to also naturally get rid of it? I would think so. It's very easy to get people to think the right thing if you get the right on the tablet the first time. But once something's on the tablet and you got to erase it and put something else, it's very hard to get people to think differently. The victims of HIV and the dedicated professionals combating it deserve our sympathy, compassion, and respect. However, at journey's end, I find myself perplexed, bewildered at times with an overall feeling of dismay and sadness. I found a research community in disarray over the most fundamental understanding of HIV, 
all the while presenting a monolithic public posture of authority and certainty. Bluntly stated, we have tests that prove nothing, remedies that kill, and statistics manipulated to the point of absurdity. 90% of global HIV corresponds to areas of great poverty and squalor. Ironically, while we may have been pursuing a phantom killer, a shape-shifting assassin, perhaps the real enemy has been hiding in plain view, clear as day, and as old as time. We can be exposed to HIV many times without being chronically infected. Our immune system will get rid of the risk within a few weeks if you have a good immune system. If you have a good immune system, then your body can naturally get rid of HIV. Yes. How can we say that HIV is the cause of AIDS when we don't know, based on current tests, whether or not Anybody diagnosed positive actually has HIV. Some people are very fortunate. They don't have these side effects, but many people do. So prolonged treatment is a problem called CD4 helper T cells. What the fuck does mean? What's it in there? It uses its memory. What does it mean? What does it mean? This cofactor is for everything. To the membrane of the cell. There, it's yeah. the cell virus yeah. grows and makes forms the cells. They're wondering. Gallo uh, is it going to is it going to change that? It's probably in the circulation. Finds other CD4 He's cells. He's going to remember effects. There is not going back on. Cells die. The body will replace we the those cells. But there's not an infinite capacity to these cofactors are important. This really battle between each how people and get ill, why they get ill. What is asked in the health journalist is to deny an existing reality, which is a strong, growing body of dissent on a scientific.